Um, as you mentioned, Dr. Chapman, I wanted to quickly just summarize some of the uh, developmental history and then the implementation of cervical arthroplasty and then um, overview some of the reasons why disc arthroplasty hasn't really taken off further because um, over since it was first approved in the US in 2007, we have seen um, a rapid expansion, but perhaps um, the uptake we would think um, given some of the outcome uh, studies that are recently coming out. So um, just to give everyone a big picture uh, view, um, Cloward first published the first paper on anterior cervical discectomy and fusion back in 1957. Um, pictured here as a Catholic nun that underwent the procedure for radiculopathy. Uh, these are some of the tools that were used um, in the procedure. And since that time, since 1958, uh, for this procedure, ACDF, not much has actually changed. Obviously, we've added anterior plating and screws We've added biological substitutes and peak cages and titanium cages, and largely the outcomes have been very good, especially for one and two level procedures, and um, still quite good for uh, three level procedures. Uh, interestingly enough, though, um, there are still providers all over the world that aren't even using plates and screws and, and swear by um, uninstrumented uh, cervical dis uh, discectomy and fusion procedures. So really over the last 60 to going on 70 years now, this procedure hasn't really changed much. And uh, we all already, you know, over the last couple of days have been reviewing some of the limitations of fusion, that being um, adjacent segment disease, pseudoarthrosis, and then the loss of mobility. And I think that last one is also, um, it's a very interesting point, especially when you look at athletes, when you look at um, certain professions where um, the mobility and the preservation of that mobility is so um, paramount to their future success. So arthroplasty first came about um, by Ulf Fernström. He was a pioneer and visionary. Um, he was inspired by the success of joint arthroplasty. And um, even back then in, in, in the 1960s, he was widely criticized and panned by the medical community. And they said that, you know, he was doing these procedures that they were completely ineffective. And he, um, 1966, he was implanting what ended up being called ferns from balls, nine to 13 millimeter spherical stainless steel implants. He put 191 in the lumbar spine and 13 in the cervical spine. Now, unfortunately, uh, the contemporary uh, critiques did end up being accurate in that uh, these balls had incredibly high rates of subsidence and reoperation. Sometimes um, he would end up taking them out, putting them back in, and um, ultimately many of these not patients. True. Like, not true, but carry on. Okay, <laughs> not true. Um, so purportedly had higher rates of reoperation. Uh, and then they, it, fell, it fell by the wayside for several decades, and then it was not until the 1980s and the development of the Charité artificial uh, lumbar disc that um, really this interest in arthroplasty was reignited, and it began with a lumbar spine, and then um, the same uh, design was used in the uh, cervical spine. And looking at the U.S. Uh, developmental history, back in 2004, that very same implant, the third iteration of that implant was approved by the FDA for uh, lumbar arthroplasty. And then in 2007, the first cervical disc arthroplasty was approved. That was the Prestige. And then in 2013, we had the first approval for a multi-level uh, disease. And as you can see here, after about 2007, um, these, these are the total number of publications on cervical arthroplasty. Um, the, the literature has really exploded. And um, the incidence and, and the actual implementation of this procedure has also followed, but obviously it's going against the gold standard of um, ACDF. So um, headway is, is currently quite slow. Um, this is just the uh, complete list of the rest of the devices that are now available, especially in cervical spine, which you can see is that there's now about eight or nine different devices um, that are available. And really the technology has come such a long way. And I think just for some basics on biomechanics, uh, we all know the nucleus resists and, and transfers compressive forces to the annulus and the end plate. The annulus resists tensile, torsional, and radial forces. And the functional spine unit is described as the elements in the collective motion between two vertebral segments. So um, biomechanically, we state that um, there's six degrees of freedom between two levels. So there's rotation in three planes, flexion, extension, axial rotation, and lateral bending, and then translation in three planes, lateral displacement, sagittal displacement, and axial displacement. So recreating this kind of physiologic movement 
in a prosthetic device has been very, very challenging. And uh, through many, many iterations, we see that devices are now um, getting close to offering six de degrees of freedom and um, at least attempting to match what is um, possible um, physiologically in our native disc implants. Um, the core composition, the, the first generation was metal on metal. Uh, there were cobalt chrom chromium alloys, and there was a concern for wear and tear here. And um, there was even studies done for uh, potential metallosis. And these were, these were really the first generation. These have largely fallen at the wayside. Uh, the current generation are largely polyethylene cores. And um, there is metal that frequently articulates on the plastic um, hinge. And these have the highest quality of evidence. And these are, um, you know, overall the ones that are most frequently used. Now, the newer generation, or I should say the next generation, are these elastomeric cores, these polyurethane polymers that are softer than the polyethylene. And they're hypothetically um, the closest bioma biomechanically to native discs. These should allow for close to six degrees of freedom, allowing for translation and movement in um, all of these degrees that we um, that I previously mentioned. And the clinical evidence for this um, is still pending. Um, for instance, the Brian disc is one that uses a, a um, elastomeric core. And the other thing um, to also be aware of for orthoplasty devices that um, many of the speakers have already touched on are the designs of the actual core and that you can have an unconstrained model. So the core is separated between both end plates. Now the native disc is actually unconstrained. So an optimal prosthetic implant should ultimately allow for an unconstrained core that still um, doesn't allow for hypermobility. Uh, most models are semi-constrained or constrained and you have the core frequently attached to one end plate. And then the next generation are these one piece models um, where um, they're a single unit and they have the elastomeric center. And these are also, you could say, um, in certain ways, they're kind of a hybrid between um, an unconstrained model, but since they're one piece, basically. So the indications that we've already reviewed, they're currently evolving. What started off with, um, you know, was largely a single level only procedure now has approval for multi-level disease. And what began as really indicated for, um, anecdotally younger patients is now um, can be recommended for a really, really wide age group. And um, the short-term complications are largely similar to fusion, they're technique related and they're approach related. So um, when comparing the arthroplasties to the ACDF, um, obviously the first concern would be in the short term at least, is this at least as safe as the ACDF? And this was something that we researched last year at Swedish, um, Dr. Sweet and Dr. Chapman um, had the idea of looking into short-term outcomes um, over 30 and 90 days, um, as well as perioperative complications. And using a, a registry-based study, we extracted um, almost uh, 16,000 patients um, in our analysis. About 2,000 of them underwent um, cervical arthroplasty and about 13,000 underwent ACDF. So I'm really, um, it's the power of large data that we can analyze such large data samples. And in the unmatched cohort, what we found was that these, anecd these anecdotal recommendations um, for demographics were, were really evident. And you can see here that um, almost 63% of um, CDR patients were between the ages of 18 and 49, whereas only about 34% uh, was the same age group in the ACDF population. So um, as soon as we saw that the, uh, the demographics and also, as you can see here, the comorbidities were significantly different between these two cohorts and that the ACDF uh, patients were much unhealthier, much older, had higher levels of comorbidity, we matched these two groups and um, we basically equalize them both on basis on age, uh, gender, as well as comorbidities. And ultimately we found that uh, before matching, there was a significant difference um, in perioperative complications, but uh, the, all of these uh, basically fell at the wayside after comparing uh, matched groups. So um, all perioperative complications. And in terms of short-term complications, both for 30 and 90 day readmissions after matching, we found that there was um, basically no difference between a single level ACDF and a single level cervical arthroplasty. The one difference that we did find was that at least um, in the National Readmissions Database, 
uh, cervical arthroplasty was significantly uh, more costly than the ACDF. And it was a build at least at nearly $78,000 versus $60,000 for a um, single level ACDF. And the length of stay was also very, very similar uh, between the two groups. So overall, we found that the demographics were significantly younger and healthier in the, in the uh, cervical arthroplasty group. But after matching the rates of complications and 30-day and 90-day uh, readmissions readmission rates um, were largely similar. So I think um, there's clear evidence that at least in the short term, um, these patients can do just as well in terms of medical complications. And um, previously, most of uh, the reviews and the trials always noted that we had limited follow-up data for um, what was available in terms of outcomes and long-term outcomes. And I think I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, the last complication that um, we didn't look into in our study, um, but sometimes doesn't get uh, mentioned as often is heterotopic ossification. So obviously um, uh, we use the uh, Meharend classification system that grades HO from one, two, three, or four, four being complete fusion, um, as you can see here. And I think once you look at some of the long-term data between five and 10 years, um, it is interesting just to track how um, both diagnosis and potentially the need to prevent HO progresses um, over time. So just reviewing some of the current literature that is available, there's not a Cochrane um, database um, study that's actually been published. This protocol was published um, several years ago and it's yet to actually um, com complete and actually be published. So this would be a recommendation based on arthroplasty for single level a disease. So this is still pending. So when we look at the next level of evidence, um, there's there's been several meta analyses that have been published. Um, this is one out of um, China that basically synthesized all the currently available prospective randomized controlled trials because we have um, close to um, somewhere between eight and ten um, globally that are available, and most of them were published. Most of them were done in the U.S. and they are based on trials that are IDE trials for um, the FDA, essentially. This meta-analysis um, included only trials that had follow-ups for at least five years or greater, and this was either single-level or two-level disease. And the overall outcomes are very, very interesting because we see here, these are forest plots for adverse outcomes, total adverse outcomes on the top, and um, serious adverse outcomes on the bottom. And again, we find in the meta-analysis that there's really no difference in terms of the difference in um, adverse outcomes. Uh, this is These are forest plots for outcomes based on their functional status, the top one being a uh, neck disability index, and the top one being, or the bottom one being uh, VAS neck. And as you can see here, the um, arthroplasty groups actually fare better in this meta-analysis. And however, um, when looking at the VAS uh, arm on the top and then on the bottom, the short form 36, the ACDF groups actually fare better. So um, in terms of functional status, it, it was largely a wash uh, in this study. But what I thought was most interesting was that in terms of the risk of secondary surgery and the, um, the risk of especially surgery at the adjacent level, you can see here that the arthroplasty group, it's not even close. And the odds ratio of 0.37, I think really highlights um, the kind of difference that we're talking about, especially when you're looking at outcomes uh, greater than five years down the road. And now uh, over the last couple of years, I think we're fortunate enough that we have now 10 year uh, outcome data that's now being published. Um, this was published in JNS Spine and it was um, the prestige disc and um, they, they termed uh, neural, they termed success as no worsening in the neurologic status, um, no repeat surgery, and um, neck disability index score improvement. So um, over 10 years, you can see that the arthroplasty group actually had very durable outcomes, and there was actually a small decrease in success, or what they term success, in the ACDF group. But I thought what was most encouraging was, again, this issue of um, significantly less rates of secondary surgery at adjacent levels that came up. And this difference actually grew the um, greater that you actually looked at the time course. So at 10 years, there was a staggering difference in the amount of people that underwent um, reoperation. 
And uh, just as a side note, this was some of their rates of uh, heterotopic ossification that they found. Um, at 10 years, there was about um, a 30 to 40% rate of um, HO at, e at either one or, or at a, either level. And the other 10-year study is the MOBI-C investigational, investigational device exemption trial with outcome um, out to 10 years. And again, uh, these, these results were even more uh, staggering in that there was such a huge difference in the rates of um, adjacent segment reoperation. So I think um, overall, and again, the rates of HO were again significant uh, between 30 and 40%. So I think overall, um, we're at kind of an inflection point for cervical arthroplasty in that we have now short-term complication data. We have you know, what was initially two-year um, study data that was extended to five years, and now we have 10-year data that shows equal, if not better, uh, clinical and functional outcomes, and what seems to be significantly better outcomes in terms of need for secondary surgery and reoperation. And I think currently, the um, really the issues with um, adoption largely lie on approval and the insurance barriers, because um, there is the issue of cost, as our study uh, previously showed, in that many of these arthroplasty devices can be more costly than what is the gold standard in the ACDF. So um, I know last year, especially for, um, we wanted to do multi-level arthroplasty, we would have to go through quite a long insurance approval process to gain approval. And even when we wanted to do hybrid procedures, it was um, there was a lot of, there was a huge barrier in terms of in getting the insurance to approve these procedures. And then the other, the other um, barrier was really the lack of clinical data. And I think now that we have 10 year data that's coming out, I think over time, or especially over the next 10 to 20 years, I think that the implementation of arthroplasty, both in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine will exponentially increase as we um, look to expand the indications and expand the use of arthroplasty. And I think we're really entering uh, the paradigm, a paradigm shift in spine surgery. We're gonna be looking more at motion preservation instead of um, fusion procedures. So I think, you know, really the future directions for this field, uh, we're gonna be looking for improved biomechanics um, for the actual disc. We're gonna be looking for expanded indications. I know in Europe, they're doing three and four level arthroplasty. Obviously in the US, we're only approved for two levels. And then we, we still need further long-term data on both um, hybrid constructs and multi-level constructs. And then um, also this issue of heterotopic ossification, if, if it's clinically significant and if it's something that um, could have certain solutions, um, perhaps biologic solutions or something um, that's embedded in the device that could be preventing heterotopic ossification. So I think those are all really um, important questions as we look um, over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, as part of this paradigm shift in motion preservation surgery. All right. Good job, Ravi. So Ravi, I'm gonna put you on the spot and then Scott has an immediate question. So great job, you look great. Um, the question that I have is, um, this is you at the beginning of your illustrious neurosurgical spine surgery career, and you have a five, six, six, seven problem, God forbid. After all that you've done in your research and your review of the literature, what are you gonna have done to yourself? Two level discipline? Uh, I would definitely get a disc replacement. And I think that I've seen it before where it seems like um, it's very interesting, but it seems like most surgeons that have to undergo a procedure, um, if they can, they prefer to get the arthroplasty. And I don't think that I would be any different in that if I had a five, six or six, seven, I, I would, I would want an arthroplasty, even at two levels, even at three levels, if I needed it really. And I know you're a great yoga practitioner. Would you continue doing your headstands on yoga? <laughs> Uh, I, I would, I would certainly, I would certainly consider it. I would certainly consider it. All right. Scott had a question. All right. Mine is somewhat of a relevant question. Um, <laughs> so, so you're, you're at the beginning of your career and, and I, I don't know if, if the neuro boards have anything similar to like the ortho boards, but in ortho, we've got this six months of case collections for our oral boards that we have to defend. Um, do you feel comfortable doing cervical arthroplasty in a similar circumstance where you to your patients that are obviously appropriately indicated during, if you have an equivalent of your board collection period where you've got the cases that you have to take to, you know, to, to pass your oral boards. And I don't, I don't know if you have something similar to like orthopedics. 
Yeah, actually, we do have a very similar system in that um, we do have case collections. And I think for neurosurgery, we have to present uh, six months of cases. And uh, the board examiners can um, interrogate us basically on any issues that they see. And I think um, I would feel very, very comfortable placing arthroplasties even immediately out of practice, just because especially what I saw at Swedish and even in my training prior, these patients do so phenomenally well. And I just, um, I would be remiss to offer somebody a fusion um, only out of concern that an arthroplasty may not be um, seen well by board examiners. And that, I, you know, I'm a huge believer in this procedure. And I, I don't think that technically it's that much more challenging than an actual fusion procedure. So I think, um, and there's great data. So I, I would definitely offer to patients and I would stand by it, absolutely. Scott, good answer. Funny, good answer. You asked that because one of my first cases that came up in board collection was like a 30 year old with two bad discs. And, um, you know, I was reluctant to do a two level during board collection. Um, but I just had to say, you know, if this were me, what would I want? And, and I went ahead and did the two level. Um, and I just want to bring up, I know, you know, I've heard kind of whispers of the three level trials going on. Has, has anybody in the panel heard, uh, you know, any, any sort of, is there any traction being gained? Because, you know, if it's, you know, the increase that we see from a one level disc to a two level disc arthroplasty, we can assume it may be true for three level as well. You know, why are we having so much trouble uh, trying to see if this is feasible? And I think Scott mentioned that uh, maybe it was Jack saying that even if we had a brand new lumbar disc, it will take five, six years from today until, but that's just a timeline. But then there's the economics and looking at the market, right? So you got to spend 50 to $100 million to do one of these randomized trials. And what is your potential market where you're going to recoup that cost? And I think as much as I do a whole bunch of three level cervical arthroplasties, there's just, I don't see in any time in the near future where we're going to be able to do uh, actual, you know, ID type three level study. I agree. And, and outside of Todd Lamon's practice, I don't think we could enroll enough pay three level <laughs> patients in a, in a multi center study for that. But, uh, you know, you're right. I don't think that practically is going to happen. Should we close? So let's come up front. Um, you come up front.